Today, we're going to get you familiar with AWS for your HPC workloads. We're just going to cover some foundational concepts. And as we go along through this series of videos, we're going to get deeper into different areas of AWS technology. Um, a few things to keep in mind as we approach this. You don't have to know about everything in order to know how to do one thing. Um, we've built a lot of tools to make it as easy as we possibly can. Yes, there's some terminology and there's some techniques that are going to be a bit different as you go along, but it's not all that unfamiliar. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, is most of it is quite familiar because most HPC is composed of compute storage and networking and some software. Now the software is where it gets interesting because the software is what pulls it all together, but fundamentally compute storage and networking is where it's at. So if you think about your traditional on-prem cluster, um, compute storage and network again, when you buy your compute, you had a choice of different CPU vendors. You might've put some GPUs in there. Um, the ratio of CPU to GPU nodes varies, of course, depending on your application and your use cases, and also depends on what kind of guess you're willing to make about future use cases, because that's, that's a characteristic of buying physical capital. You have to, you have to mest estimate what you need in advance. There's a, there's a lot of other things that go into a compute node, of course, though, right? Um, uh, local scratch storage, you have to think about the memory to core ratios, you have to think about how many cores per socket, how many sockets, and, and a bunch of other different factors there. Um, you can have local disk attached to your nodes, you can have network attached local disk, which is a thing that we call elastic block storage, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, of course, you may have Lustre uh, on premises, you may have NFS file shares for home directories or corporate data, and then of course there's object stores which are used for a whole pile of things, and we'll get into more of that as we go along. Um, networking is really important in an HPC cluster, or at least it can be a really important factor, depending on your needs. Um, InfiniBand is one of the most common technologies we see on premises, but of course, you can start to see some more exotic fabrics if you've got a supercomputer. Um, and then of course, RDMA over converged ethernet or Rocky, uh, which is a pretty common thing to see uh, when people just have high speed, high speed ethernet around and they wanna be able to use that for their HPC. And, and again, depending on your use case, depending on your code, some of these things may be more important than others. And then finally, software. Now on premises, most of the software that you use is typically um, an installation of an operating system, something to actually deploy that operating system across all of the nodes, manage the nodes, monitor their health, uh, and then provide things like you know, MPIs, compilers, math libraries, all of the other stuff that your developers need to be able to get their code running. And then finally, job schedulers. Uh, so you can actually, everybody can share use of the cluster over time. Now. We can map all of these things onto the same kinds of concepts in AWS. Um, in the, under the compute banner, we, we will sort of generically refer to compute usually as a thing called Amazon EC2. Uh, that's our elastic compute cloud. Um, and so those symbols that you see on the bottom, at the bottom of the screen there, the C6i, HPC 6A, those actually map to the, to the CPU architectures you see in the top, the top row, uh, Intel, AMD, ARM, and so forth. Um, Ditto when we move over to storage, you know, local disk in our world is called elastic block storage. I mentioned that earlier. Um, Lustre for us is a thing called FSX for Lustre or the file system service for Lustre. Um, Amazon EFS, Opens EFS, these are things with, that offer really cool appliances for, you know, for deploying NFS into your cluster environment and sharing it across multiple clusters if you needed to. And then of course, Amazon S3 is our object store. So, so we've, got, we've got things that map onto all of these things that are quite familiar to you already. For networking, um, and we're gonna have a whole set of, set of talks about networking, um, what you need to understand straight up is that our network is extremely large. Uh, um, we decided a few years ago that we would actually invest in that network and instead of building a small island of InfiniBand, which initially felt like the right decision, we decided instead to invest in a thing that we, that we invented, which is called the Elastic Fabric Adapter. And the EFA, uh, as we call it, that thing has got some really interesting capabilities for being able to exploit the mass scale of our fabric to actually deliver packets extremely quickly. So it's, it's purpose, purpose built, it's sort of plug for plug compatible with InfiniBand. Plugs into all of the same um, APIs. Uh, so if you're running something using say OpenMPI and Vapitch, Intel MPI, those things run straight on top of EFA, you get the same experience and you, won't, you really won't notice any difference. Uh, scales just as well in 99% of cases that, that we've tested. 
Um, and then over on the software side of things, this is really where things start to diverge and get pretty interesting. We still have the same kind of experience if what you're looking for is, a, say, say, for example, a Slurm-based cluster using MPIs, lib math libraries, all the same things. All that stuff is the same as what you would find on-prem. There's nothing really all that different about it. So Parallel Cluster is a, is a package that will orchestrate all of the various elements in AWS to come together to form a cluster that looks and feels just like an on-prem um, traditional Beowulf cluster with a head node, compute nodes, and all those other things. There's another thing that we've got, which is you know, a sort of a canonical um, a clustering experience that's native to the cloud, which is the thing called AWS Batch. And so that's a container-oriented uh, life form. Uh, it lives and breathes in containers, but what it does is it actually, it's, a, it's an always-on scheduler that sits here in the cloud. You don't have a head node as such. You talk to the scheduler through an API or through a command line or a web interface, and you, you submit jobs. You tell the scheduler, you, you, you can define some queues and you can define some things called compute environments. Um, and it, it basically then builds clusters for you on the fly, or at least compute fleets for you on the fly to run the jobs that you're putting into the queues through those APIs or through the web front ends. And it's actually the thing that runs probably some of the largest workloads in the world that are running on AWS are absolutely running on batch. Um, it's just really, really good. It's become extremely good at exploiting EC2's leftover pools of compute, which we call spot. Um, and it's it's it does some amazingly large workloads and it's it's regularly running workloads that are in the millions of cores every day. So um, so so those so far so good. There's some familiar experiences there. Batch is definitely different, but it's not it's not something that you've never understood before and never experienced before. And then again, things like MPIs, math libraries, Slurm, uh, compilers, all those things just work because they look just like normal. Uh, they look like a bit of software that runs on a machine, typically a Linux environment in a clustered, in a clustered construction. All this stuff really is familiar. Now, there's also a lot of stuff that's different. Pretty much everything that you're going to find when you look at EC2 or when you look at any of the file, uh, the file storage services, everything has got a lot of knobs and dials on it. Uh, you're going to find this is this is almost going to be like using KDE again, where you pop open a window and there's too many things to configure. Don't get intimidated or put off by it. Um, most of the default settings are actually set to be pretty performant and pretty useful in most general use cases. Now, of course, we've got a lot of different use cases we're trying to serve, and so that's why the knobs and dials are there. The knobs and dials are there so that you can get in and tweak if you need to. Initially, my suggestion is actually don't tweak too much. Ignore most of the knobs and dials, and as you get a bit more confident and a bit more interested, dive into what some of those knobs and dials do and see if there's, if there's things that are actually interesting to you that are going to either boost performance or give you some sort of utility um, that, that makes you more productive. At the end of the day, that's the goal of all of this stuff, is to make scientists and engineers super productive. Now, the other, the other thing that you're going to find is quite different as well, is pretty much we bake elasticity in by design into everything that we do. So if you look at, say, for example, FSx for Lustre, our Lustre file system, it's not just like going and designing a Lustre cluster straight up and then just leaving it there for the next five years. If you want it to be larger or you want it to be faster, you can go into the Lustre configuration and you can redesign it on the fly and expand it. You can make it larger, you can make it faster, and it actually has methods for rebalancing where all the data lives, increasing the number of OSS pairs. It, it's got all of that, that structure built in. Um, again, with you know, elasticity, when we build HPC clusters, the HPC clusters you're going to use in the cloud, they're going to be a bit weird because at first you're going to notice that there are no compute nodes. But when you put jobs into the, when you plug some jobs in the head node through, say, your usual Slurm interface, the thing's suddenly going to expand and compute nodes are going to come into existence. This is a normal way of doing things in the cloud. We, we consider this pretty normal because the cool thing is, is when you're not using it, it all collapses back down to a very small footprint and nothing's getting used and it's not costing you anything. Now, there's another key difference, which is that pretty much everything that we do in the cloud has got an API on the front of it. So every EC2 instance can be controlled by an API. All of the storage can be brought into existence modified, you can have the contents of the storage changed, you can change the, the, the compression algorithm that you're using, you can alter the, the size and scale of a file system or the size and scale of a cluster. You can do all of these things through APIs. You can bottle all of this stuff up into a configuration, into a blob of text, 
um, that is essentially is code that describes your cluster. And so we call this idea infrastructure as code. And you're going to hear us talk about that a lot as we go through this. One of the one of the best things about infrastructure as code is since we can actually define whole slabs of infrastructure and whole behaviors inside this environment as bits of code, it actually means that we can build new services and then provide those services to you. Or other people can come up with with their own idea of how something should be done and they can share it with you. And you'll see a lot so of So from today's those. discussion, just keep in mind, everything is a function of compute storage networking and software. We have most of the same things that you will experience for, the, for all of those elements. Most of it is gonna be extremely familiar to you, but with some added bells and whistles from the knobs and dials that we do and the built-in elasticity that we bake in by design. And all of that gives you the ability just like it's future-proofing for your workload so that you can expand quickly as and when you need to. Anyway, until next time, I uh, hope you're getting a lot out of these videos. If you like what you're hearing, please click like and maybe subscribe to the channel.